this is what I'm interested in. If I become a Buddhist, what do I get out of it? I think this is the question. I wish there were more young people here because that's really who I want to speak to about this. But it's okay. I love you. <laughs> and I see some of you who are here, okay? Um, Buddhism is a kind of evolution revolution. We started this in our center this year, and the retreat manager got carried away. He has cups with it, and t-shirts, and hats, and everything. And it came from one of our students, because transcendence and transformation, all these words and everything. And this is what it is. Buddhism, to us uh, in the West, when we leave Christianity and come into this, is totally different because it is virtually an evolution that is taking place in us that never happened for us within the confines of a restrictive church. I know that Ketri Dhammananda, he, he wrote some uh, material on it, called it uh, the Buddhism teaching the Buddha, Buddhist, uh, Dham, the Buddha Dhamma, was a, a statement of releasing people from the slavery of religion. I didn't look at it as slavery, but I will say that it was very confining. And so we're going to look at some of that now, what happened. But this is where this word evolution comes. And we say revolution because everything's a revolution in America. <laughs> you know, I see it's a women's revolution, and then it's this, that revolution, and then, you know, the Trump revolution. Everybody has a revolution going on. It seems my whole life has revolved around these evolutions uh, since the 60s. So let's look at what came up here. Mankind needs a balance of mind. This is where it all starts. And today, the balance, to be balanced, you have to pursue three states as a human being. And this is something I found out when I was working in mental health, to let somebody go out on the street from a mental institute or a hospital after they have a breakdown. There are three things that the doctor wants to look at. He wants to look to see that you have a healthy mind. He wants to look to see that you have a healthy body. And he wants to look and see if you have a healthy spiritual pursuit, leading to the balance of understanding of yourself as a being, your environment, and your world. So there are three things that are going on in modern medicine that's right there saying you need to have a spiritual pursuit. So there's a spiritual part of you besides the mental and physical part. And he, you know, when I looked at this, I was working in mental health advocacy, and I said, well, she's a witch. You know, she's pursuing the Wicca. He says, I don't care if she's pursuing the religion of mice. <laughs> as long as she's pursuing something, and she has a support structure, and she's working on something that is outside of herself. That is what they were interested in, a balance between working outside of yourself and working on just your mental and physical well-being. So I found that really interesting about this. Why Buddhism? To me, Buddhism is about change. And we point this out in our tradition. If you come to us for training, we don't want you to come for us for training if you're not ready to change. It, re uh, it reveals the true nature of everything, the Buddhism, and how things work. It doesn't hide anything from us. This is what is so different. It is revealed for us and not dictated to us the way it happens in many other religions. The teaching is to be seen and understood by using what the Buddha found uh, found, and he left us instructions. There were specific instructions left to him, which we don't hear a lot about right now. I've been to hundreds of temples, asked hundreds of questions from probably a thousand monks, and the education level of saying what the Buddha was actually doing from his suttas is not there very much. Dr. Punaji was very, very special when he was here. And I'll tell you a secret, he's my spiritual grandfather. He's the person who helped to get me to stay to the, come to the temple every night. I told him my house was a block away from the temple in uh, Washington, D.C. when I first started and found my teacher. And the house I rented turned out to be one block away. And he said, well, I don't see why you don't come every night. So I did. <laughs> I was waiting to start a new job, and I just did. And then the job fell through, and I just kept going. So the universe put me there so I could have uh, 
Monty Ponage, you tell me to come. And also, he liked my car. He liked to go to the mall. <laughs> and I said, wait a second. Wait a second. You're a monk. Why do you want to go to the mall? I didn't understand in the beginning. And I said, monks don't shop like that. I stop shopping, you know. And I'm, you're going to shop? He said, no, no. I just want to go to the mall and see everything and see what's evolving with people and watch the people and everything. And that's what we learn to do in our tradition too because of him. So the teaching has to be seen and understood. It offers a solution for everything we face in life. And this fascinated me. I have yet to move, to bump into something where Buddhism does not give me an answer from the text that I can go back in and find out what to do with any situation you can throw at me. I haven't found one yet. Uh, our true power is uncovered in Buddhism once we know the truth of our experience and our existence. We didn't talk a lot about this in Christianity, uh, in the churches that I was involved in so much. We got a little bit of it, but we didn't, it was not provable. And I was in the scientific generation. I wanted to have more proof. We are not expected to accept anything that we cannot see for ourselves. This was the Buddha's own system. And he gave us a set of tools. So certain tools were revealed so that we could see what needs to be seen. And I would say what we need, what we uh, given to us so we could see what needs to be seen and heard. Uh, good, that was good, wasn't it? Seen and heard and smelled and tasted and touched and thought. So all six sense doors. And this sixth sense door never occurred to me since nursery school. We were always talking five senses. So in the West, we're talking five senses. We're not talking six. And all of a sudden, Buddhism comes along and says, you know, there's six sense doors. One of the things that you realize when you're studying is that uh, nothing is happening to you. Everything is happening from you. You might not understand this in the beginning. But most of your suffering is happening because of Atta. And the Atta is believing that the per everything is personal. When we say self, we found the word self very deceiving and pulling us away from the understanding of the Anatta teaching. So we had to keep going through the Majjhima Nikaya and searching and going through certain things to find the best way to get a person to understand. Because it isn't self I'm going to remove. I'm not going to remove yourself. I'm going to remove the consequence of you believing that you're a self and everything, therefore, is personal. That's what I want to remove. And you're going to remove it. I'm only going to point. I can't fix you. That was another revelation. The priest was going to fix me. The minister was going to fix me. Everybody was going to fix me. And, and I come to Buddhism, and he says, well, you're going to fix yourself. So that was a revelation, too. OK. Um, the point is that nothing is happening to you. Everything is happening from you. And if you just think about this for a minute, you are disturbed and feeling heavy because you feel what? Everything is on top of me. And that is the person who has the breakdown, who has just fries the, we say, pulls the pulls the switch on the electrical system for the body and collapses in a breakdown because it was so heavy. The world is on top of me. But it isn't. It isn't. It's actually all coming from here in the mind and how you choose to perceive what's happening every day. So the truth is that, is that you control your destiny in life. You control that because once you figure the nothing is happening to you, everything's happening from you, you well, what does that mean? It means it must be I'm sort of in charge. I'm sort of in charge. Wow, so Buddhism isn't pessimistic. All of a sudden, Buddhism is very uplifting and powerful, isn't it? I don't have to go to confession and go in and bear my soul to the priest and have him tell me you have to repent and then give me penance to do for the week. Instead, this is all talking about what's actually happening. So you have free will and you have volition. This is very important, which matches up with what they say about it. much of the 
Christian churches which I was involved in, but we didn't really have it when we sat there and thought about it. But the Buddha comes and tells us mind is the forerunner of all states. So the sixth sense door, mind made are they. All the states that we experience, all the emotional states, all the craving, the clinging, and the emotional states themselves. The emotional states have names. This is why I want you to understand, feeling is not emotion. Let it sink in. Feeling is not emotion. Feeling, neurologically, we can see on a piece of equipment, you feel a painful feeling, but it isn't you. It's your body system registers a painful feeling, a pleasant feeling, or not so much of anything, you see? But the emotions, think about it, all have names, don't they? The hatred, the anger, the frustration, the depression, the desperation, all of these things, the panic attacks, the agoraphobia, it all has names. So to always remember that you can separate the physical three kinds of feeling that you see in Abhidhamma and the emotions that are the names, okay? So mind is the forerunner of all states. It means it's the leader. How important is this? How powerful are you? How powerful are you? Each day, you are creating your own experience in this existence. If I tell you, you are creating your life experience. You are. Nobody else is. It's not out there. So this is the reverse of what we think. Bhatti Ponaji played a game at, at the, the first big Dhamma talk I went to. It was one of his series. It was an early part of the series. And the question he put before these professional people was, what came first? Was it the existence or was it the experience? What was it? Experience. Yeah, you're supposed to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Most people, I jumped at said, the existence. The earth was here. This is all here. And I'm born into it. And I have to experience it. Oh, really, he says. <laughs> is that true? Hmm. What is the reality? Is my reality your reality right now? Why? Because if I'm looking this way, you're my reality. But if you're looking that way, that's your reality. Hmm, that's interesting. So what does it mean if the experience comes before the existence? It's very powerful. Each day you are creating your own experience within this existence, okay? What you think and ponder on becomes the inclination of your mind. This is what the Buddha tells the monks. What you think and ponder on, what you allow your mind to think and ponder on. This is a perfect example. You get up in the morning, you're smiling, you're laughing in the kitchen, you have a great day at work. But if you get up and you start grouching and groaning and complaining and everything, and you're angry at the kids or anybody else, you go to work and see how it is that day. You set yourself up and it leads. The next one that he says is what you do in the present moment dictates what happens in the future. That comes from the, the, the suttas about the karma, okay? And it's a very simple statement, okay? What you do right now determines where you go. Look at this. If this, if this is my life here, and I'm going to flow into the future, and you're going to worry about the future, but the future could be any one of these things. You see how many there are? Okay, so what I do here dictates where I'm going to end up down here. Isn't that true? Yeah, you've had experience with this. I have too. It's just that no one ever points it out. So you actually form your own future. And it, when we're talking about future, we're not talking large distances either. Don't get caught in that. Don't get caught in we have to talk about past lifetimes, this time, time, and the next lifetime. It wasn't all about that, OK? It was about, let's shrink it. How about this morning, noontime, and this evening? OK, let's do it again. How about the hour ago, right now, and the next hour? OK, let's do it again. Five minutes ago, what you said, right now, and what happens in the future, you see? So what you remember, you're talking past, present, and future in all of those, those ways. It's your responsibility. The whole thing is your responsibility. 
you alone can affect your destiny. Boy, is that different. I thought God was going to come take care of everything. <laughs> I really did. And when I got married the second time, and there were two kids, and I had two, and we had one more, I thought those five kids were fighting in the kitchen. I honestly believed the Holy Ghost was going to come down in the kitchen and settle everything for me. He never showed up. <laughs> you know? I, I used to get mad at the minister about that, and he may have had a little joke about that. I mean, it's not a bad thing to believe in the Holy Ghost. Please don't get me wrong if anybody's Christian here. Because I felt like I had a very good relationship with the Holy Ghost. But I never thought about what, it was ac what was actually happening scientifically with this relationship until after I wasn't there anymore. Then I look back and I say, well, when Catholics have a novena, like they sit in a circle, someone's sick in the hospital, the power of a group of people thinking you want someone to be better and feel better and send them good feel is very real, very real. And this energy of loving kindness is measurable now. There's no question anymore, MIT does have it. MIT measured and, and they said it's real. So now all of a sudden we have an authority. <laughs> For the untrained mind, suffering happens, uh, can happen at any time. The root of all the suffering comes from the unsatisfactoriness. The suffering is ignorance of this whole thing. It means you're ignoring what? You're ignoring nature, the natural laws, and you're ignoring how everything works. That's what's happening. So the suffering comes from that and craving, okay? And the delusion ignites the craving. So delusion is the idea, everything's about me. That's the atta, the delusion. And it ignites the craving. And the craving is I don't like it, I, do, I like it. And these translate into I like it, I want it, attachment. And I don't like it, I don't want it, aversion. And then you get attached to getting rid of aversion, <laughs> okay? Um, I went running to the teacher once and I said, did you know there's attachment and aversion? <laughs> he said, well, I knew, didn't you know? The craving evolves into the clinging. The clinging happens to be, once you say, I don't like something, then the clinging comes in, says, in your mind, why? Because it reminds me of this and it reminds me of that and I don't like it and I want to make it stop. And so that's what happens to you. And then the clinging causes the tension in your life, and the tension leads to the stress disorder at work, and the stress disorders are the major foundation for depression. And that manifests, and it makes disease. What is disease? Dis-ease. You see the word? No ease. Uncomfortable suffering in the mind and in the body. All of this reduces your enjoyment at home, cuts into the productivity in school, and cuts into the productivity in the workplace. Now, this Chachaka Sutta has some really good information, so I threw in this slide, because if you want to understand what the Buddha was saying is, I want you to go deeper, I want you to see how it works. And so he says, since mind is the forerunner of all states, I want you to look inside. I want you to understand how all phenomena actually works. And he tells you, in order for you to let go of all of this, you first have to see it and understand it. That's his basic approach. So the origination means the arising of the phenomena. The disappearance is the passing away. The gratification is how and why I indulge in this desire or this aversion. And the danger of it is it takes you away from the present time. It takes you, your only place you are actually alive is in the present time. I'm not going to say Eckhart Tolle's moment, okay, because if you look at your watch, it's a moment, 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 moment. And I had a man come to me in an interview in a retreat, and he said, I said, how's your meditation? He's going well. I said, it's going wrong. Well, what's wrong? He says, I'm exhausted. I said, why are you so exhausted? He said, I was trying for a whole entire hour to stay in the present moment. <laughs> You have to grasp this. And then when I stopped, I looked at my watch and I almost started to cry because I realized it was leaving, 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 and I couldn't stay in it, you know, because there was another one and another one and another one. So this idea is it's just a cliche. It's a cliche, apparently. And 
You can stay in the present time, though, can't you? Can you do one thing at a time? One thing, and then you move to another thing. And this is what the Buddha was talking about. Efficiency and you know the power of your concentration, but not over-concentration. He was trying to get you to be able to do one thing at a time. And the escape, this is the best part of the sutta is here, is the escape at the bottom. In other words, he found an escape. Now, he's not talking about Nibbana here. He's talking about he found an escape for you all the time in daily life. And this is what we started fishing around for. We started hunting for it. Why? Because you don't want to come to Buddhism thinking, I'm going to work to get to Nibbana, and that's the final escape. Yes, it's true. And you don't have to come back ever again as a human being. Yes, you're finished. Yeah, but what about this life and the next life and the next life? What about that? Did he do anything? Did he give you anything? We didn't get anything in church. <laughs> we didn't get anything. We just went systematically having faith that God would support us and lift us up. And this was a disappointment for me when certain things happened and everything started collapsing. So his core teaching reveals who we are and how the suffering works. He tells us the Four Noble Truths and how to use them in life. This is a core teaching here. He gives us a pure generosity, five precepts, and five hindrances. And he basically is telling you that if you keep your precepts, the hindrances won't come and get you. That's what he's doing here. We don't get this much anymore. I've been through three Sunday schools I've worked in, and I don't see it in Sri Lanka. I don't see it in here in, in this country where they teach you the precepts when you're little and the hindrances at the same time. But the little kids even do understand the hindrances. And we should be teaching them together because when you keep your precepts, the hindrances won't bother you. But if you if you steal, you're going to feel bad, right? And if you kill something, you're going to feel really bad. Even if you kick a dog or do something nasty, you're going to feel bad. These hindrances come and bother you. But they won't bother you if what? If you keep your precepts. So you see this got into relationship here. Okay, so I think that's really something. Uh, I found some very old books from very old monks that said, well, we used to do that. So things have changed. And then, when, who are you? The being yourself. You are five aggregates. You are six sense doors. You are three kinds of feeling. You've all heard this stuff before. What you can't think, why you can't think the suffering away. It's important to explain to you, why can't I think the suffering away? The suffering is a hindrance. It's a distraction and a disturbance. The big news here is, it's because you don't understand that the hindrances have food. They have nutriment that make them come and bother you. What is the nutriment? I am. I am the nutriment. My attention on the hindrance makes it bigger and stronger and stay there longer. That's the news. And we don't generally teach, and this isn't just me or a few people, this is massive. If we don't tell people the, the operative information they need to have about these hindrances. So people think like this. They think, I have to destroy them, annihilate them, eradicate them, stop them, suppress them, and subdue them. That's what we think. But here's the interesting part. If I cut off their food, they become destroyed, annihilated, eradicated, and they are gone. So this is like an army going to get the enemy. You don't have to fight the battle if you find the supply line. If you cut off the supply line, you wipe them out. And they don't get killed, and you don't get killed. You see? So it's very tricky. If we don't tell you that the hindrances have nutriment, you will never be able to understand. You don't have to fight with them or sit with them or anything else. Every time you sit with a hindrance till it goes away, you're feeding it. That's the danger of this. Okay, and we don't know how it all got mixed up, except there weren't a lot of suttas that we found that are talking about it, but we have enough that if we take, well, I have 11 suttas in the Majima concerning hindrances, that stress, we need to abandon them, release them, relinquish them, let them go and let them be. But nobody listens to it. I don't know why. Okay? 
And then if you go to the Samyutta Nikaya, you get whole dissertations on the nutriment for the hindrances in relationship to the arising of the seven enlightenment factors. Well, that's pretty important, right? You want the enlightenment factors to arise so that you can get to the deepest level, fall into cessation, and experience the nibbana. They won't arise if, there's, if the hindrances are still there. So they're telling you, uh, what is it called? Um, how do they put it? Sort of not smart attention. I can't remember the word they say. Not not intelligent attention being paid to these guys when they come up. If you let them go and, and just leave them alone, they're going to fall away. But if you feed them, those enlightenment factors will not come up. And that means that you'll never get a balance of your invest your mindfulness investigation energy and joy and your tranquility your concentration and your equanimity it won't happen so you need to um, remember about the nutriment a practice using the other thing we do is we take the the uh, the seven links of dependent origination that fully reveal the three characteristics of existence there's a rule that exists that um, in order for you to completely internalize and understand fully the uh, three characteristics of existence, which is the anicca, dukkha, anatta, you, if you practice learning the, the dependent origination parts in this lifetime, so you're talking contact, feeling, craving, clinging, habitual tendency, which we say about bawa, habitual a tendencies and the birth of reaction and then the aging and death of that event, okay? If you start practicing with that, you're going to immediately see how Anicca plays in this, how the dukkha happens, the suffering, and how Anatta is the way out. Anatta is the reverse of the Atta. The Atta is taking it personally, we said, so if you start taking things less personally. And the point is, when somebody gets you upset, why hold on to it? Because of what? Anicca. But we forget about Anicca. And Anicca should be right there. I, I tell the kids, the teenagers, when I teach them, we need a flag. What flag? A Buddhist flag? No. <laughs> we need a flag, the Anicca flag. And the moment you guys start having an argument, I'm going to wave the flag. Anicca! Anicca! You know, cool it, because in five minutes you're all going to be happy again. You see? So why pick on each other when everything is changing all the time? Oh, that's Anicca, you see? And everything's changing. So if you really believe this is a cosmic law, this is a law of nature, then embrace it and watch how it works in your life. You know, if you're in the jam, I need you. <laughs> it's gonna break sooner or later. You get caught in an accident, you miss an appointment. <laughs> I need you. <laughs> you know, somebody gets in your taxi, makes you really mad because he tells you which way to go. I need you. <laughs> Just let it go. So it's it, this is what it was about really activating these things and the parts of the dependent origination just show you how these parts these seven pieces they show you how the suffering is happening we didn't have anything like this in church we were constantly constantly talking about guilt and sin and repentance and all of this stuff involved in it and don't worry god will come take care of everything well you know <laughs> I'm, and I'm not saying it's bad because I think that I think the scientific part of it I was trying I'm not good at expressing it scientifically believing that the Holy Ghost is supporting me or uh, was not a bad thing he saved my life I would say he saved my life but now what I know is believing I wasn't alone was saving my life believing in being supported instead of alone was what was really saving my life okay and that was what really pulled me back together, especially coming into this. So we take, in this situation, we do not worship a higher being for the solutions that we seek. We take full responsibility for our life and carrying out our solutions. We grow strong, stronger because of this. And we pay respect to the extraordinary, supernormal man who found these answers when they weren't there at all. 
and he taught them to us. He made a decision not to go sit in a cave and live out his life or plant a garden and have a little house on top of a peak somewhere. He decided that it was worth it to, to share it. And that's what we're thankful for when we're in front of the Buddha. We are thankful for that. We are worshiping that fact that he taught the same subject for 45 years. That's amazing, you know. Amazing when you consider that Jesus taught for three years. And, and somebody told me it's two and a half, and I went, uh, <laughs> two and a half. And look what happened, <laughs> okay? But you have 600, close to 600 million Buddhists in the world. That's the present figure the Japanese like to use figures, so I went and checked. You know, say so close, to, close to 600 million here with all the different schools of Buddhism, okay? So that's what we're doing. We're paying respect. That's the way we're worshiping. And when we get down and we touch our head on the ground, we're surrendering our mind. And when we open our hands in a full prostration, what is this opening the hands? We're opening ourselves to his Buddha Dhamma instructions and letting it in so that we can practice. So all of this was very symbolic in the beginning. We thank the Buddha in our minds for giving us his antidote for suffering in life, and we practice and use his escape plan and support systems if they work. We are not obliged to use anything that does not work. So there's nobody saying, no, this is what God said, and it has to be this way. This is not like this at all. Did the Buddha leave us the way out of suffering? This is the most important part. Yes, he did. Whoops, there you go. I love that guy. Don't you love that guy? I mean, I, I found that, and whoop, there he goes again. Okay, <laughs> that was great. Samawayama is the Buddhist practice cycle to purify and retrain the mind. This is why Samawayama is so important. It is a method where it, re it, it purifies your mind and it retrains it. It's very easy to understand. Right effort shows us how to retrain mind's tendencies. Recognize, the first step, recognize the unwholesome mind states when they're in your mind. You, you can do that. You all know this from precepts and teaching and everything. When something gets in your mind that is unwholesome too, you're going to notice there's a little tightening that happens, a little change in tension, a little tightness in your neck, right in the back of your head. There he goes, he's stretching his neck right. Okay. <laughs> then you release the unwholesome mindset. You release the unwholesome mindset and you relax mind. That's the second step. The relaxed step is put in there. Why? Why do we do that? Because the Anapanasati Sutta, the instructions for the breathing meditation, have the step of tranquilizing the bodily formation, and the head is part of the bodily formation. It's a funny thing. In our day and time, we've gone through maybe 20 or 30 years where we believe the body is from here down. It's funny. Women's calisthenics in the 1970s was playing with the body from here down. And you ask many people, where's your body? From here down. They'll be like, <laughs> And the one thing that is taboo in most societies, still taboo, don't talk about an illness that's here. See? Don't let anybody know there's somebody in your family that has an illness here. You can talk about any other part of your body. But then let's go back to the Buddha. What did the Buddha say the body was throughout the text? What did he always tell you the body was? from here to your toes, from here to your toes. Ananda comes, he says to the Buddha this, he says, "Where, Lord, where is the world? And the Buddha goes, from the head, the top of your head, to the toes. So he's telling the whole world is inside you, which is the statement of you produce your experience out here. Isn't that amazing? He said that. So you recognize the unwholesome mind state, release the unwholesome mind state, relax the mind. That's the purification, isn't it? That's the purification. Now watch what else you have to do. You have to bring up a wholesome mind state. And if you gently smile as you return to your object or your task in life, if you smile, the smile is an immediate wholesome in your mind. If you smile, you're not angry anymore. 
somebody getting mad at you, I'm getting mad at you, and if you smile, it's fine. You, you see? So if you are full of joy, think about it. If you're full of joy with something that's going on in your life, can you be discontent at the same time? No. So in the Brahma Viharas, it tells you when you're practicing the joy part of it, that you can it, all, all thoughts of discontent are abandoned. That's what he's telling you. And the second piece of this is to keep developing this wholesome mind state. So now this is also the map for the present day research you find online, if you want to look it up. And you look it up, it's called, uh, how do I change a habit if I'm over 25 years old? There's a set of research in there, because some people believe, you know, if you're over 25, that's it, you can't change. <laughs> and we had a woman say, oh, I can't change. That's impossible to change. Ten days later, she had completely changed in her retreat. <laughs> it was really funny. And she admitted it, too, you know. And she came out. I mean, people come sometimes, they're just like this. But they're at the retreat. And by the time they leave, they're just completely open, and they're alert, and they have all this knowledge in, a, in an order they can remember it. We can talk to them and question them at the end, and they have the full picture of how this works. So the point I'm trying to make by showing you this slide is the first two do not change a person at all. And we are caught right now with many instructions, not just in meditation, but in psychology too, and in psychotherapy, of if you want to stop being angry, just don't be angry for a week and tell me how it feels. But that's not an answer. You have to replace it. Now, our grandmothers knew this. Our grandmothers knew if we were naughty when we were little and doing something wrong, mommy wanted us to change it. She would say, don't do that anymore. Instead of doing this, do this. Keep doing it for 30 days and this will disappear. That's what the grandmothers would say. So this has been in traditionally in societies, in many places I've asked that question, in Borneo and all kinds of places, and just everywhere. You know, the grandmothers always know this, and this is like a piece of Buddhism, and actually we had this sort of in Christianity too. It's very widespread, but we don't use it today because psychology has decided that the way we're going to do this is tell you just don't do that anymore and you'll feel better. But that's not the answer because you left a hole. This is why. And the universe will not accept a vacuum. And the little people, this, I'm Irish, you have to excuse me, this is sort of probably, this is my superstitious part. But as an Irish person, I've got to tell you, the little people are up there in heaven, and they're taking care of everything. And when you do everything, every one of you's got a book up there. It's true. And these little people are up there. And if you stop being, if you stop being angry, the little guy's going to come, oh my God, I don't know what to do. Look, get the supervisor quick. There's a hole here. I don't know what to put in it. What am I going to put in this book today? He's not angry anymore, and he's been angry for 35 years. What am I going to do? Well, I, I don't know. Look back in the book. He's been angry. Put the anger back in there. And the guy starts being angry again. You know, they get really shook up when you want to change. It's true, they'll let you change if you let them go long enough, but you gotta be patient, just keep doing it the right way. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> so, repeat the cycle over and over, and that's what you're doing, you're cleansing the mind. So this is what it looks like, basically. What you think and ponder on becomes the inclination of your mind. So you have to cleanse the mind and retrain it. And once you get this going, you keep it going all the time with a little bit of a smile, you apply it in your life, and it'll keep going. It'll keep working. You practice letting go and letting be, and when any event happens, if it grabs your mind's attention, then you let go of your personal concern. And you're letting go of Atta every time. And every time you're letting go of Atta, you're supporting the growth of Anatta. And this is applying the impersonal perspective and taking life a little less personally. So while sensing something, can you practice realizing only what it is, is the game. Play the game when you're doing it without story. 
without thinking about a lot of things, can you see what's happening? And that's all. That's anatta. Live the anatta. Can you practice for a day? This is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. This is what this is about. This is a drill. Whenever you hear this in Buddhism, it's a drill. They experience the pure process of anatta. He was drilling his monks and changing them and practice noticing the anicca, how it's working, and replace the distractions with forgiveness, with compassion, with loving kindness, with smiling. That's what you do. And you're opening yourself to change. That's what's happening. So you've got to be curious and try to observe how the seven steps of the dependent origination operate one at a time inside an event. I'll show you that in a minute. But the craving, we've already said, if we do not understand what craving is, how can you let it go? Is the problem, isn't it? And if I say to you, craving is desire, and I walk away, has it told you anything? Uh-uh. So we have to go further. And what we came up with is, ooh, that's interesting. Okay, so let's define it. That's what's important. Craving is the I like it and the I don't like it mind. It's the first personal opinion that follows contact in the line of human cognition. When you see something or you hear it, immediately you like it or you dislike it. It's painful or pleasant and you like it or you don't like it. That's what's happening. And so the symptom warns us when this, this suffering is coming because the symptom is craving always manifests as tension and tightness in the mind and in the body. And when this happens, you go to the practice cycle and follow the instructions exactly. And you go back and you use this again and you cleanse again. And you recognize, you release, you relax, you smile, you come back, and you keep on going with a smile. It's not hard. It wasn't supposed to be hard. Didn't you know what he taught was easy to understand and immediately effective here and now? Did you know that? It wasn't supposed to be complicated. That's what we were hunting for. I couldn't have stayed if it was complicated. I would have left. <laughs> How do we change? The more you see how things work, the less your mind fears, and mind becomes clearer and more powerful. We practice an impersonal perspective, which is a view, by taking the sense context less personally, and it changes everything. Remember the anicca, that's the impermanence. So you let go if you do, reacting will stop, and you begin naturally to smile more. People become happier, calmer, clearer, steadier, with more balance. This is your chart. Now, what this is, is the contact, is when you understand what contact is, most of you, right? Is when the eye might see a color and form like this, eye consciousness comes in, the three pieces make contact happen. Works with the ear, hears a sound, consciousness comes over, into the ear and then contact. That's ear contact. With contact as condition, feeling arises. Pleasant, painful, or neutral. With feeling as condition, almost always craving hits you. And it's the eye. That's why they're red. The craving always manifests as attention and tightness in the mind and in the body. I like it or I don't like it, mine. It's the beginning of the personal opinion. Then immediately on top of it, if you don't understand what it is, you're going to have the clinging. It's the story that runs in your mind. Why don't you like it? Right? Why don't you like it? It includes all the thoughts, opinions, ideas, concepts, imaginations, and uh, that pops up, pops up too. Yeah. <laughs> okay? That was a misprint. And then you have a personal library in your head is what we examined in Bawa. And the personal library is your personal reactions. It's how you usually behave in a situation. What you usually do when she says something to you and you usually come back and get her upset. It's the same way every time. That's the reaction. Give birth to during the process of the cognition. And each person has a different library. They have a library built up 
from the environment they grew up in and how people develop the habits of reacting certain ways. And then you give the birth to that reaction. You give the birth to the reaction. You see how this chart is different? It's a chart that's looking at one phenomenological event at a time in your life. It's showing you how the suffering actually works, OK? And then when you give birth to it, there are three kinds of giving birth. You have the mental action, the verbal action, the physical action happens. And then this aging of the event with the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, and the death of that event. Now, how fast is this actually happening? <laughs> In your mind, these little, this is a circle. It's happening really, really fast, these events in life. So if I were to go like this, it's like 100,000 of them. But can we actually watch them and start to notice them? Only if you see this chart and learn it and understand it's happening this way. Can you go and edit a, holiday, a Hollywood film right now? No. But if I taught you how the film is created and the frames of the film, you could go in the editing room and edit it and clip it and see all the parts of it, the movie. Right now, you're caught in a movie. You want to get out of the movie. You have to learn how the movie is constructed. But you don't have to go, for instance, to learn 128 kinds of feeling and 13 kinds of this and 50 kinds of that. You don't have to do that. That was a school that developed the Abhidhamma school. And that way, you know, I don't want you to sit and think when you have a feeling come up, oh, what is that, number 52, 25, or 14? Oh, wait a second, maybe that's three. You see, if you do that, and this is the danger. Now, Abhidhamma is not bad. I'm not saying it's bad. Because I, there are people like my grandmother, <laughs> and she loved detailed things, you know? And if I had been able to have taught her meditation first, and then she decided to look at the Abhidhamma, she could have gotten a deeper understanding. But if I don't teach you a meditation where you can see first, and you first do the Abhidhamma, and then try to go into the meditation, oh, you are in trouble. <laughs> you know, you got so much stuff in your head. It's almost impossible for me to say, empty the cup. It's almost impossible for me to say, empty the cup. And when we look at what the Buddha said to Vacha about this, when he had the discussion with Vacha in the Vajakati Sutta, he said, Vacha, you can't understand this, this teaching if you are practicing another way, following another technique, going to another teacher, doing it another way. Don't expect to understand this. He said it to him point blank. Then he tried to explain to him how he was teaching, because Vacha came to him with, I'm learning this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this and this and this, and he said, stop. You can't do it by reasoning, by reading and just reasoning, and you can't do it if you mix stuff up in a bowl. What he gave us, the, this, this in particular, is a recipe like a six ingredient cake mix. If you take the butter out, no way. Cake, no cake. If you take the eggs out, no cake. <laughs> you see, he told you how to make the cake with six ingredients, six simple steps to purify your mind and completely change. This was the benefit of it. So the conclusions are not that important right now. I have just a couple minutes, and I want to point to you. Um, if you want to get a copy of these, can they ask for it at the office? Is that true? Okay, because you have the copyright. Because we didn't make copies this morning. For How many of you would like to have copies of this whole thing? Okay, this is about, let's see. Just raise your hand so I can see. So maybe 20, 30, yes, 30 yes, copies? Yes, yes, please give your email address. Oh, email address. You can do it that way? Can you do that for him? Okay. All right, just look around here for just a minute because one of the things I've put on the board here since I was a placement counselor and had my own placement business and consulting firm, I just want to point something out about this. Buddhism, in particular, whoops, that's the wrong direction. Buddhism <laughs> was good, wasn't it? Very balanced. <laughs> um, it, it gives you the power of a completely clear mind. It calms your body and calms you and teaches you how. We teach techniques. I teach techniques 
for relaxing before you go into a meeting and perceiving, manifesting the meeting is going to come out exactly the way you want it to, with the settlement you want, with how much money you want in a raise or things like that, before you go into the meeting. You've, pre -con you've conceived this. Then you let go of it. But you have to keep smiling and smiling and smiling and smiling. And all this positive energy and sending loving kindness to these people that you're going to go into the meeting to before you go in. And this is real stuff. I mean, Bonte has told, I've told CEOs before you go in the meeting, you go in the bathroom and sit, you stand in front of the mirror and I can just see other men coming in and out. What is this guy doing? And he's just standing there smiling for at least five minutes in the mirror with his watch, you know, before he goes into a meeting. He gets everything he wants. And I have stories of people who get, you know, things that they want that way. But you have to see it completed in your mind. But the power of the clear mind it affects the home, the school, the business, the professional trades, everything in employment. And to ride the cutting edge, we look for people who were willing to be curious and creative and attempt to ride the cutting edge in whatever they're doing. And I have counseled with CEOs and lawyers and judges and doctors and surgeons and things like this, okay? And these people really, really want people who are decision makers and brainstormers and team leaders and they are willing to do this. In order to do that, you need to be able to practice and get to a level in an aware system of about the fourth jhana. Now, when I'm talking, that is not a difficult thing. In 10 days time in our retreats, we're teaching you an aware form of practice like Sariputta practiced. And when you hear uh, that particular sutta is 111, the Anupada Sutta. And if you read it very carefully, you begin to understand he was practicing a form of meditation where he was aware he was not going into absorption. The reason you have two schools today of jhana practice or serenity, and then you have insight over here, is because they lost this practice I'm talking about. This is what we think happened. It's only an opinion, but we are seeing you have insights and all the insights you want to acquire and understand. They happen, but they are synonymously happening with a relaxed, happy form of meditation you can do all the time. The benefit of teaching this way is you can go into life with your meditation, keep it going all the time. So if he told the people it was easy to understand, immediately effective here and now in life, and inviting deeper inspection, many people tell me that after a retreat, <laughs> They want to go home. They don't want to go back into deeper inspection. <laughs> you know, and, and some of the systems you know, that are happening is, um, in, I, I don't, I'm not ashamed to say this one name, is going, is known for this, you know. Pain, pain, okay. And the idea is what does, does someone say when they come out of that kind of a retreat? I survived. <laughs> they have t-shirts. I've survived. That's and I'm there. How can you be like that? They come into our retreats and they want to stay for another two weeks. They want to go deeper. They want to see more. They're so eager they can't take it because they're seeing everything put together and they want to go deeper. And then I asked this guy, and that was his only remark. I survived. <laughs> you know. So anyway, this is this is what. We want in business, we want people with cutting edges, with open minds, that are not disturbed by the past or the future in their head all the time, that can stay in the present time. Those people are priceless in the marketplace now, and I don't do it anymore. But I'm not pitching you to sell it, you know, I'm just telling you that's how it works. And that if you're alert and you're in the present time, and you understand how to interview, you're going to get the job. You can't just walk in there and interview. You have to know the company, know what they did last year, know what they make, know how much they did and what their plan is for the future. If you go in there like that and there's 100 application, uh, applicants and you're the only one that did it, guess who's going to get the job? You are going to get the job. That's how it works. You know? I'm glad to be out of the vibration of it. <laughs> okay. But that I'm just teaching, teaching, trying to show you that that's what it is. 
So we have to close now, but I, um, I didn't want to make this, I hope this was enough for you in understanding the difference between um, some of the other setups in religion and what we're doing. I, uh, because I'm this kind of a teacher, I always take you through this to see how we believe it's not too difficult for you to understand, to put the pieces of the puzzle together. That you don't need to study 37 requisites in isolated formats. That someday we should do that. It's really fun to do a, les a lesson on the 37 requisites and have you hear it all in one sitting and how it comes together. You know, one monk I got a chance to sit up with two big monks and they let me. I was very evangelical at that point and I wanted to tell them, you know, talked about the 37 requisites. And I started to do it, and then we sat up late in this monastery with this woman and me and three monks. And the one monk was crying at the end. He said, I've never seen anybody put those together. I thought they were just went for this and then that and then this and then that. And I said, no, no, it was one big vegetable garden. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like just carrots or just potatoes or just tomatoes. It was one big lesson of a vegetable garden, you see, for survival. And so when you hear it, it's magical because they each affect each other. That's why they were so important, this block of, of things. And then when you take the other, the aggregates, the three kinds of feeling, and the precepts and hindrances, it's all woven into it. You begin to see, oh my gosh, there was a picture. In closing, I just want to say one thing. Um, I met the other day three women uh, 71, 72, and 73 years old, and they were Buddhists all their lives. They were here in Malaysia, and um, they said, she was saying to me, but no one has ever explained to us what Buddhism was. I was fascinated. I couldn't believe it. I just listened, and I, uh, my heart felt like, how could they have you so long, and no one ever told you? Their question was, what did he do anyway? Did he find anything? And he, what he found was magical. And one of the shocking things to me is I can't believe anybody could ever point to this and say to you, it's pessimistic. How can anybody do that? Only out of ignorance. Only out of ignorance and, and only being exposed to it in a very shallow, isolated way with one or two subjects. Could you ever say that this masterpiece, this incredible thing that was done by this person, you know, what he decided to teach was pessimistic. It's powerful, it's awakening, it's calming, it's order, it brings order to the world, it has the power to bring peace. Einstein wanted it because, and promoted it because it was so logical. It's done with logic and deductive reasoning. And you can see everything I tell you about. There's nothing I give you you can't see for yourself. That's why we thought it was so important. So let's put our hands together and we'll say a closing prayer. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, the devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddhist dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.